Are Asian Americans and specifically Chinese Americans provincial and regional when they even come to America, David? We got to talk about this because we want to know if they're trying to divide themselves. If our parents are not from the same hometown city, then it is a pity because we cannot be friends. Maybe we can pretend. Oh, we got to talk about this. This guy on Reddit was like, how strong are Chinese provincial identities amongst Chinese Americans? Andrew, he goes on to say that he, his parents come from the same city in Northern China. They grew up eating shandong s foods like manto, dumplings, big pots of Napa cabbages, ribs. I believe that's called pai gu zhu, uh, duan bai tai, potatoes, vermicelli. He said, man, I would only eat Cantonese food on special occasions. I noticed that me and my friends were all from a similar background. And I I noticed uh, Chinese from the Guangdong and Fujian diaspora, they tend to form their own groups, even though we're all born in America. Is this true or is this just something that I noticed where I came up? Wow. All right, everybody, we're going to talk about it. Do Chinese Americans, specifically of all the Asians, first of all, I think all Asians kind of do this on some small levels, but Chinese specifically, are Chinese the most divisive and most provincial Asians in America? Let's try to answer the question. Yep. Yeah, make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications, check out smallassos, smallassos.com. Good for you. Even if you are hyper provincial, there's something there uh, in the sauce that's going to appeal to anybody. I mean, long story short, Andrew, Chinese Americans are not the only ones that do this. I think that India might even be more atomized in terms of identity, Ooh. right? But but yes, in any sort of hyper large population, there is atomization and like sub genres and sub sub genres of people. Would you agree with that? Yeah, because like, yeah, it's just that's... like too big of an immigration group to like all just be down with each other. Even Filipinos, maybe you're from an Ilocano family, maybe you're from a Tagalog family, maybe you're from. Uh, one from Mindanao or something. Yeah, yeah. But I definitely think, I think the divisiveness amongst Chinese, and it's not necessarily in a harmful way necessarily, but definitely the tribalism amongst different groups of Chinese people is clear because there's so many Chinese people. Like there's millions of Chinese people in America. If you were to just pretend like all Chinese people came from the same background, you'd be overlooking a lot of things. Now, I think there are unifying factors and we're going to talk about it. But we could give a whole list of reasons why people are generally tribal uh, in a Chinese way. Right, right, right. And I think a lot of it is key that he said both his parents are from the same city in northern China because mm -hmm. our even our grandparents are from very, very different places. So that's why we're actually like a mixture of a lot of different types mm -hmm. of Chinese ourselves. And I think that that's what allows us to see it. And I guess what I'm saying is like to me – do you think provincial stereotypes are true? I do think that people from a certain province have a general attitude that I agree with, but I just don't understand why you would need to feel beholden to that provincial stereotype as somebody born in America. Right, but I, I think that when he says his parents, I much more understand like immigrants who just got here, they're looking for a tribe, they're looking for a community. Of course, you're going to mostly immediately go with people who are most likely like you, people from a similar region, even from the same city who share some of the common memories about that place. Right. Of course, you're going to feel more trust with them. That makes right. sense to me, right? Immigrants do that all the time, right? It is, but I think as American-born Asians and American-born Chinese, it's not that you can't hold on to some of that, but- it makes sense that you have less of that tribalism. Yeah, yeah. You know what I think? I think, honestly, I would guess that he didn't get raised in a pan-Chinese church or something like that because that really shoves people from all across the diaspora from like oh, Samoa. We had Chinese from Samoa. We had Chinese from uh, Southeast Asia all sharing the same church, even though the small groups were like in each individual dialect. Um, I will say this. I think that working class people tend to be a little bit more... Uh, maybe, I don't want to say clannish, but maybe clannish in that sense of like, in New York Chinatown, which is more working class, a lot of the Toysan or the Kanto kids, they hang out even to this day. And the Fujianese kids, they might hang out more. Of course they mix, but it is a little bit separated, would you say? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. No, there's still that separation. I mean, also because, you know, uh, you operate in Chinatown, those second generation Cantonese are still also operating with, the first generation Cantonese, like the immigrant class. They don't even right? speak English, right? Right, so they're constantly in that world. So I, it's not beef, and there maybe was beef like decades ago, but like right now, I think it's just like slight, the like slight acknowledgement that, yeah, there's like slightly differences in our community, even though we're all under the umbrella of Chinese, 
they operate in different dialects that are essentially right. intelligible to each other. Right. In, in Fujian and Guangdong are actually pretty close to each other. It's only separated by Taozhou, oh, which is where oh. Chiu Zhao people come from. Oh, yeah, David, in distance. But I will tell you this, language-wise, they don't sound very similar. It's a Can different language family. Cantonese and Fujianese do not sound similar. I would actually say that Cantonese sounds more similar to Mandarin than it does Fujianese, probably. Right. And uh, But I was saying... So you take it out of the hood, sort of like, I guess, like I said, the old- Enclave, working class. Ghetto, whatever you want to call it. Um, in Irvine, California, I think that this type of provincialization matters a lot less. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Because the kids in Irvine are probably all upper middle class, all speaking English. Their parents are probably have some level of like five out of 10 English fluency. So they're almost like more becoming American. Mm. Anyway, let's just, uh, point number one, in terms of uh, talking about provincialism amongst Asian Americans, specifically Chinese Americans, language is one of the most specific markers of a tribe of people. If you guys study linguistics and how it um, correlates with anthropology, it is true. Obviously, it's nowadays it's not a one to one link, but like it is true that language is sort of a link to a tribe. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of like gene pools. Not always, but like generally share the same language. Sure. And that's like something that continues over time. So I guess, do you, do you feel like people, when they come to America, they're going to just feel more comfortable with people that are like where, from where they're from? Yeah, for sure. Of course. Point number two, language and class are not necessarily always connected, but in America, due to selective immigration waves, those uh, differences might be exaggerated or exacerbated. So for example... In Asia, Andrew, there's rich and poor people of every group, right? Because of any sort of language, there's like millions and millions of people, especially in China, that speak that language. However, in America, the immigration wave could have got a narrow selective slice of that. So then it's almost like, oh, all Wenzo people in Flushing are rich. All Taiwanese people in the OC and Roland Heights are rich. But of course, if you went to Taiwan, you would see all the levels of Taiwanese people. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that depending on how those groups came over, you know, um, I think on another side, like that could mean that uh, those groups, like it's less almost like the Asian communities in America are less classes than in Asia. Because in Asia, everybody is that race. Then you really separate by class. But if you come from... Taiwan, then you will know other working class, poor Taiwanese families in America. And then you'll also, they'll, they might know and be friends with or share spaces with the upper class Taiwanese, where maybe in Taiwan, they do that less. Right. In Asia, when everybody's one group, they do like have their own ways of separating. Whereas in America, because the numbers are small, it might be around language group. Yeah. Uh, point number three, Andrew, um, when an immigration wave arise of a certain group of people to America, it really ha depends on what structures their group took on. So for example, the reason why the cantos in like an Oakland Chinatown or a New York Chinatown are so tight knit is because when they arrived, let's just say in 1900, they needed the family associations to really figure life out. But nowadays the Asian community has grown or the Chinese community has grown so big, there's no need for a recently arrived immigrant to associate themselves with a family association or some sort of like a uh, deeper clan. Right, right. I mean, I think that those family associations served multiple purposes. Maybe uh, first when they got here, it was for business. You know, you put all your money together and then you guys invest in uh, a person of that group's business at a time. So they needed to be very tight knit and very high trust. But of course- yeah, specific Chujiao, Hainan, Fujonese family associations, Toisan family associations, the Hoksan family Ho association. Hokin, right? Hokin, all these Zhongshan family associations. All these family associations are not as needed nowadays. Now, sometimes they still operate like back in the day where they'll still have a small, tight-knit community of newcomers coming in to help each other out. So that makes sense. But essentially, the more Americanized you get and the more mixed you get, those type of nuances are not as neat. Those nuanced communities are not as neat. For example, if your parents come over as academics, their uh, clan that they're trying to navigate is almost like the college or the university's ecosystem more than it is like a uh, enclave's ecosystem. Yeah. Point number four, parents could have different groups of friends for different reasons. So for example, Andrew, I noticed that uh, our, like our dad, for example, he's from Hong Kong. He would more like play ping pong and go out to eat with his Cantonese friends, but his like academic side where he was like friends with all these like uh, 
visiting professors or whatever like that, they would be more like mainland Chinese mm -hmm. because there's a higher proportion of like mainland Chinese academics in America than like Hong Kong academics. Yeah. And I think that if your family runs a small business in an Asian on in a Chinese enclave, your parents are probably going to be more embedded in that community because that's the people that you need to operate around for that business. But again, if your dad is an engineer or some type of professor, he's probably going to be a little bit less regional provincial in just his whole lifestyle because it's just like his work and his life is not based on that. But if your job was to sell to other Cantonese people or work in a Chinese community, then you would probably be maybe more provincial. Right, right. You're talking about monetary incentives or yeah. just like system. What, how do you, which systems do you operate in? Mm -hmm. um, point number five, it also depends on how much your parents coach you on old world regional stereotypes or how proud they were or how much they coached against you hanging out with other provinces. Mm. So for example, this guy uh, is talking about how his Shandong mom always talked to Shandong talked up Shandong people as honest and hardworking. I had to laugh at that because that is what Shandong people do say about themselves. Right. I've heard that stereotype before. And I guess like, it's just so weird because all these things from the old world, how they like intermix, I guess with America, it's just like, it, it could even depend. Like, let's say for example, your parents are from different provinces, right? Depending on the situation, you could lean into which, whatever identity of your parents like ranks higher in that specific thing that people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like people like that are mixed, they do do that. Right. You know what I mean? You, you like can play both sides, I guess, or like, yeah, just feel like you're, you're like, oh, I'm getting the best of all worlds or something like that. And um, point number six, do you feel closer to someone f from the same place because you guys together think you're better than everyone else? Or do you think it's because you've more shared some of the same struggles? You mean, are you uh, united by a common struggle or united by a common superiority complex? Yeah. Are you united by elitism or are you united by like almost more of a refugee experience? Like, man, we went through the same mud. Yeah. And that's why we are shared. Mm, I think for Chinese, uh, to be honest, I feel like maybe with more Southeast Asian groups from my friends, you know, as we know, growing in Seattle, like they were all pretty mixed with each other. Uh, Cambodians and Vietnamese and Lao people, they were definitely all hanging out together because they felt more like their families had the same story. A Ref similar refugee experience. Yeah, maybe not the same language. Maybe their food was a little different, but their foods are also more similar down there. So it's like, but they, their parents had a similar immigration story and similar struggle. They would not be beefing as much. Oh, I will say the North Viets and the South Viets, there would be some, not real beef, but like, you know what I mean? Some... So, uh, maybe just because the northern it's depending on whatever whatever elitist people uh, right, right, right. right. But, but regardless what i'm saying is um yeah i think that for chinese people i mean who are the most elitist i would say to be honest well to do taiwanese people might be the most elitist now it's funny because taiwanese people they're considered a mandarin speaking group but when you say mandarin speaking group a lot of people, they're referring to mainland Chinese You're Mandarin talking about speakers. like a Beijinger. Yeah, which Taiwanese people are not Beijingers. If anything, if they're related to mainland people, they're more related to Shanghainese people or like Fujianese people, to be honest. Right? You know, that's the relationship. It's closer to that. So I think it's like, I guess in, I guess that's interesting. Yeah, that's why I'm saying, yeah, to your point, that that is true. And it, it's so complicated. If you guys know a lot about all the onion layers of the Chinese world, we could like try to peel it back for you. Uh, you know, we try to keep it more general most of the time. But yeah, it gets like super granular. You could be from like Xiamen, which is more Hokkien. You could be from Fuzhou. And then that even splits within the Fujianese. So people are like, oh, no, like Fuzhou oh, is this oh, way. Oh, and like, not to mention, <laughs> like there's different types of Taiwanese, right? Like I was, like we were just saying. So right. there's like, not that, I don't think Taiwanese people are this Devise, especially Taiwanese Dude, Americans. Even they within don't Shandong, you can be from like Jinan, which is more like Li Mim, which is more like uh, the inside non-coastal part versus being like from Qingdao and stuff like that. It's like the different, the food is different already. I Less seafood, yeah. I feel like at that point, if you're from different cities from across your province in China, then it may just depend on how nationalistic or proud of that province you are. Like right. if you're just a chiller person in general then yeah you're just not going to carry that pride and you're not going to have to hang out with your type of person as much but but if you're like yo Shandong people are the best people or like uh, Beijing people are the best people or Sichuan people only are the coolest Chinese then I have to only hang out with other people yeah I noticed that uh yeah like you said if your parents made a lot of money 
keeping it like real, like let's just say one zo, you're gonna keep it one zo. Right, right, right. You're more inclined. <laughs> like you're more like from a clannish family, but then there's super, super successful clannish families and ones that aren't as much too, and then that might even change the equation a little bit. Point number seven, Andrew. Tribal markers and where it places you on a hierarchy can vary within context. For example, Andrew, people were saying that Guangzhou, in Guangzhou, because Guangzhou is part of mainland China, Mandarin took over mainland China, speaking Cantonese in Guangzhou was kind of discouraged, but it's a point of pride in Hong Kong because it separates you from the mainland. Mm, So even speaking Cantonese right there, it's already like a identity shift. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not like as valued in Guangzhou, the kids don't need to be good at it as like a HK kid to feel HK. Right. It all just depends on your incentives. Like maybe a Hong Kong person who's making mo- a lot of money from working with mainland China and Mandarin speakers, they're going to be like, well, you know, you don't have to speak Cantonese. You know, you just learn Mandarin. That's yeah, just learn English. And yeah. yeah. Just, just maybe learn English. But then if you're a Hong Kong person who's like trying to keep Cantonese alive, obviously you're going to be like, anti-mandarin you know what i mean so it's like all just different incentives man and i think it's interesting and i guess uh to answer the question do chinese americans feel divisive amongst themselves some do but i would say mostly it's the immigrant class that is more so but but doesn't it carry over yeah it can carry over a little bit but i think like that's why here's my thing this is actually what i believe this is my conclusion here is that there's like different levels. Sometimes you're very open and inclusive of everybody when you don't talk about culture. Like, let's say I've, I've seen groups of Asian friends or even Chinese friends who like, they don't really know their friend's Asian background. Like they don't talk about you it. You mean saying like they don't even know where each other's parents and let alone grandparents originate from like a hundred years ago. No, yeah. They just don't ask those questions to your friends. They're just like, I don't know, I'm Asian. Like we're Chinese. I know we're all Chinese, but like, I don't know what type of Chinese. Like, I don't know where mom's from. We just hang out or I just date this. You know what I mean? Like I've seen friends like that. So if you don't think about culture at all, in a way you're like culture blind, you're like, yo, we're just in America. Everybody's not necessarily whitewashed, but American washed. Yeah. We're just inclusive here in America. At least maybe your friends are all Asian, but you're like, it doesn't matter what Asian. And then when you think about culture to a level, but you only know the basic things, I feel like then you become super tribal because then you're just like, oh, they're like me, so I'm just going to hang out with them, right? And then Oh, it's yeah, like your mom is from Shandong? Yeah. We can be homies. Yeah, that's like a very simplistic way of looking at it, right? But you're like, I have to know where you're from so that I can judge you. <laughs> you know so I, mean? I can see if you fit your provincial right. laojia stereotype. But then I feel like you come back around in the circle and when you're very when you're pretty much cultured and you understand other groups, then you can be more inclusive and diverse again, but understanding the differences and I feel like that's more of where I see myself at, you're at, you know, where like we can have these conversations about where your parents are from. Like I can talk to a Chinese person or a, a Vietnamese person, but I ask them a few cultural questions right. about their family and not feel any type of way because I've just met so many people and I don't have a superiority complex about it. Right. But that required me to drop my ego and drop any sort of like preconceived notions like you can joke about the stereotypes, but we also know people are people. So there you get in the circle where you know nothing about culture. You're inclusive. You're friends with everybody. You know a little bit about culture and you see things too simplistic. And then you know much more. And then you're like, all right, I'm cool with everybody again. Right. You did all the research to almost arrive back at the same open point, but with way more knowledge. Yeah. I would say this, like, I think a lot of people attribute things to like, being from a certain sub dialect of a certain region when it was really like the immigration wave juxtaposed with that thing. Cause there's poor and rich people from everywhere. Yes. There are certain provinces. One zoe is richer than Taishan. Mm. That's straight up a fact on like a, just we could analyze a localized GDPs or whatever. Like I'm saying, but it like everybody is unique, but it's like what we just see, we, we form a world full, full of like 300 people. Like I believe there's a study that says cute, the human mind cannot even balance more than like 300 to 450 people in a mental ecosystem. So we just get the inputs into that and then we shape our worldview off that, not knowing that if we met 3 million people, let alone 30 million people, all, we would meet people that break and confirm every stereotype from everywhere. Right. But it's right. like our mind is only made up of like 300 people. Mm. So that's why it's like sometimes, I, I will say this, not all, but like sometimes Asian Americans or Chinese Americans, they could be 
even more ignorant, like you said, because they know a little, but the little makes them like they it's it's very like broad stroke stereotypes. Yeah. And and I'll say this, man. Yeah. So anyway, guys, let us know what you guys think. Let us know how it is. I know like amongst my Indian friends, they were saying, yeah, like some of them, you know, they, they, they the parents are into casteism or, or uh, what's it called? Stateism. You know, what state are you from or whatever? But like other parents are super not about that because that's why they came to America. And oftentimes, like you said, it has to do with what jobs and careers they have. If they have a more of an Americanized career, they might think more American about it, more flat social structure. If they think more made all their money in the Asian world, sometimes it maintains organically or consciously. Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. Is your type of Asian, provincial, in whatever Western country you guys immigrated to or not? And what have you seen? Until next time, we the Hot Pop Boys. We out. Peace.